This is the halachic letter we're talking about today, lecture 16. So we're really going to uh, go a little more in depth into what the sect was about and how they differed from the other sects at the time. And we're going to see is actually a lot of the issues that they differ on the points of contention are quite surprising. They're not necessarily the ones that you'd expect them to differ on. And uh, uh, scholars were quite uh, made mistakes too. And later on, were quite surprised when they came across this letter, what the things they're really arguing about. So here we go. So the letter itself, the halachic letter, was found in 1954 in cave four. Now, it was found in 1954, but it wasn't published until the 1980s. So the question is going to be, why? It was first brought to light in the 1980s, and then it was published, excuse me, in 1994. So, uh, and the existence of the letter was only announced uh, in 1994 by John Strungel and Alicia Kimran. It sounds like Kumran, but it's not. And the question is going to be, again, why in the world was it such a delay in bringing it to the public's attention? So we'll get to that. But in Hebrew Bible, it's called Mitzat Maaseh HaTorah, which means some precepts of Torah or Halakha in this case. Awesome. Torah, the word Torah in Hebrew really means it co comes from uh, yora, yora, to, to shoot like an arrow. You're supposed to hit the mark, takes you on a certain trajectory. And the word halach itself means uh, right from the word holech, a path or a guiding way. So uh, the, the ideas basically are interchangeable here. So even though in Hebrew it's called mixama, say, uh, HaTorah, it's that these scholars named it the halachic, uh, like the halachic letter. See, okay. I have a question. So, uh, uh, I have a question. Yes. It was published yes. in the 1890s and in the 1980s, and the existence of the letter was announced in 1984. So, it it, yeah, so we're going to get in 1994. In so, that those dates. Are confusing. Yeah, I made it. It came. I meant it came to light in the 1980s and wasn't really published until 19. No one even knew it existed besides these two guys, John Strongo and Alicia Kimran, until the uh, until the 80s, and then it wasn't really published until 1994. So now the question is: It appears that at least Strongo knew about this. He was the one who really had the letter first. Seems like he actually knew about it for 30 years, and we're not really sure why. He never provided an explanation for why he never told anyone about this. Herschel Shanks, who's a well-known archaeologist, by the way, obtained a copy of it, published it in the Biblical Archaeological Review. And uh, Qumran, uh, Qumran uh, who, who is Strungle's partner, who was brought in by Strungle, later on successfully sued Shanks for copyright infringement for publishing the letter. I threw that in for Scott, who does uh, copyright type of stuff and intellectual property. Well, you're, Scott, you're intellectual property, not copyright, right? You're muted. You're muted, Scott. Yeah, copyright is one rubric of intellectual property for the copying of works of art by authors. So yeah, it's an I, it's an intellectual property. Okay, yeah, I thought you find that interesting. Yeah, that that actually happened. Okay, uh, but more importantly, really for our concerns is who wrote it. It was written by the leaders of the Qumran sect, and it refers to twenty specific points of halacha. Uh, these are points in which differentiates the the Qumran sect from uh, the Sadducees who the letter is addressed to. So it's basically, it's a letter to the Sad Sadducees saying, this, uh, these are the points of law we disagree with you on. And then there's a third party mentioned in it who appears to be the Pharisees, even though the letter is not addressed to them, they are mentioned as well. So, so as I already alluded to in the introduction, the, introdu uh, uh, the issues of division between the Qumran sect the Sadducees and the Pharisees really seem to be small issues, what we would call minutia, 
not necessarily larger dogmatic issues such as belief in angels, afterlife. Uh, Josephus notes that the different sects, the different sects disagreed on those type of issues, and scholars understandably thought that these were really the major points of contention. Apparently not. They were really on much more technical legal grounds. They were had the big issues of the, the, these were issues of contention. Okay, so I just mentioned that. Okay, so uh, the letter, by the way, does uh, buttress what Josephus says about how really strict the, the Essenes in general, because he talks about how the Essenes in general are the strictest of the three groups and the Qumran sect probably being an Essene group. So it really shows that they were interested, how really interested they were in halakh and precise observance and strictness of the law. Okay, so it just, it just so it speaks, when it speaks of uh, we in the letter, it's speaking of, this is the Qumran sect, the Q, the U is speaking of the Sadducees, and the they are speaking of the Pharisees. Again, it's a letter, letter written to the Sadducees, but mentioning the Pharisees as well. Okay, and some of the issues, the issues of contention are the same ones mentioned in the Temple Scroll, which we had discussed a while back. So let's look a little more specifically at what really are these issues of contention. So they're arguing over liquid being poured from a pure vessel into an impure vessel. And the rabbis, the rabbis, in other words, really the Pharisaic camp is declaring that both vessels are pure because if um, uh, because if you, if you look at if you're, or no more impurity is being put into the vessel, the lower vessel, because the impurity does not travel upwards from the impure bowl on the bottom upwards to the bowl which water is being poured into it from. So impurity only the, the rabbis would say if you have an impure bowl and it's being poured into a pure bowl then that make the water pouring down makes the bowl on the bottom impure as well. But the, uh, but the Qumran sect saying, no, the impurity travels upwards as well as downwards. Does that make sense? Yes. yes? Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure it makes sense. Cause it's hard. It's hard. Not you, you almost have to really see it. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and by the way, this cause this could cause an economic hardship. This could cause you to have to dispose of, let's say, a vessel of olive oil or wine. So it's not just a matter of impurity. Something is dirty, can't uh, can't use it. It has an economic impact. Like nowadays, you have to, and this happens in Hilchot Kashrut as well. Uh, something becomes uh, something becomes unkosher, and next thing you know, in certain circumstances, or you accidentally mix meat and milk together, more likely to happen in the kitchen where you only have kosher ingredients. But you have a mix-up like that. Well, at times, uh, the food can be salvaged. You do betul bashishi. In other words, you have 60 times as much of the kosher. Uh, you have 60 times as much meat as the milk got, that got, uh, got into it. You could save a little piece of the little milk and the meat got nullified. But you don't, if you don't have 60 times as much, then you have to throw out whatever you whatever food product you were using and you have to worry about koshering the pot and if you were cooking in a Klee Harris an earthenware vessel then you can't uh, then you can't even cash a vessel so that's gone as well so this does have a financial impact okay okay so interestingly enough that the sadducees also took the same view as the Qumran sect that uh, impure that impurity goes up and down when 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 pouring. So both of these two uh, groups took a stronger point, uh, a, a more rigid point of view. And there's some speculation there was some connection between the Essenes and the Sadducees. Particularly, it's believed that perhaps Can the Essenes. Yes. Can I interrupt for a moment. On, yes. on point on point number one, what I don't understand is that. The rabbis declared that both vessels were pure, and you're telling me that the somehow the pure vessel on top made the lower impure vessel pure. No, it it, it didn't. It, it didn't. It it's not written well. I was copying the note. I, it's 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 what it's it's what it's saying is it's not adding any further impurity to the impure vessel. 
It's not it's not written well. I apologize for that. Okay. But yeah, so so it's just not adding new impurity because it's pure. But it's not it's not purifying. Good point. So uh, it's not this is not surprising that uh, the Sadducees and the the Essenes might have some similarities in the sense that I believe the Essenes were probably also the leadership was from high priestly circles, but unhappy with what was this Sadducean practices in the temple for they weren't quite up to snuff, weren't pure enough. So it's not surprising there would be some similarities in the way they would approach rules of purity. Okay, so there's a possible link which I just mentioned. Okay, and now we go to uh, Tevil Yom, which means immersing, uh, like this is like the word Tevila, immersion and Yom in the day, immersing in the mikveh during the day. Okay, so uh, the, general, the general idea is when you go to the mikveh for purification purposes, well, that's why you go to mikveh for purification purposes, but you're supposed to go in the evening, not during daytime. So the question is, if someone, for whatever reason, it's unclear here, if a person goes during the day, during the daytime, is at least bidi avad after the fact, is the immersion still kosher? Does it still rid the person of rid the person of impurity or not? Okay. So the letter says, if the person goes before sunset, no good. Again, they're taking a machmir, in other words, a rigid approach, saying even even bid the avad after the fact. We can't accept it. We, uh, you have to, you'd have to do it again. However, the rabbis, in other words, the Pharisaic school, is going to say, oh, not so fast. We may could uh, carve out another category which will help the person, and we don't have to be quite as machmir or quite as rigid. They, they say the person is a state of like a, a, a not totally pure, but not totally impure until sunset. And then at that point, they'd be, they'd be considered pure. Now, I'm not, now I'm not sure what, exa what exact situation they're really talking about, what type of impurity you're talking about. And what's the reason for the impurity? There's different things that make one impure. Uh, like the granddaddy of impurity would be coming into uh, Tumat Hamet, which means coming into contact with a dead body. That's the ultimate impurity. But there's a lot of other uh, they come into contact, come into contact with dead animals. It makes you impure. A woman in nida is considered impure. So, and in the case of nida, a woman would have a woman has to after uh, after when it's time for her to go to the mikvah has to wait until nightfall, at least a for, for the first night. But then, it, and it's, it's optimal she goes immediately uh, the first night she can to the mikvah when she's done after she's done with Nida and then counting seven clean days. But uh, if, she, if she's not able to go that night, whatever reason, she's, they're out of town, there's no mikvah in town, the mikvah's broken, who knows, whatever. Then she can go, then she can go during the day. So I'm not, I'm, it's unclear if they're referring to what exactly the case is. But the, uh, for our point here, at least, we're, what we're seeing is, again, the Pharisaic, the Pharisaic point of view is uh, much more lenient than the uh, than the Essene point, or at least the Qumran sex view here. Rabbi, can, oh. can I interrupt? Sorry, I almost should ask this at the beginning, and, and some of this may be because in my I can't. Sorry, some of this to me is all such craziness. I don't know why anyone would take it seriously. But I guess what I'm trying to it, on your first screen, you said these are kind of minor issues. It wouldn't have been a screaming match between these two but isn't this the groups but isn't this the kind of thing that the Qumran sect would have been extremely adamant about and would have made a big stink about it so is it was a really are these really minor issues I'm, I'm talking so, about your so, word so, on the first page yeah so I'm actually we're gonna we're going to get to that so if you in a, in a slide or two so if you could just it's a good point and and um Scholars, scholars who style, scholars who study this, point out that you also have to like for, for us, like who could even get worked up over this? It's like how many angels dance on the, the head of a pin type of question. Uh, but to um, but back then, particularly as you point out with the Qumran to Qumran sect, which is absolutely obsessed with ritual purity, and just during this time in general, particularly when you had a temple and you had to be pure for uh, to do sacrifices and be in the area of the temple. 
this was a much bigger deal. And it, it, there's just a disconnect between people living today to our sensibilities and the sensibilities of people living back then. But we're going to get a little more into that in a moment, Jonathan. That's an excellent point. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so uh, it's also interesting to note that even though the, even though the Mishnah wasn't codified until 200, uh, 200 CE, uh, we already have in the second century before the Common Era, we see that these issues are being discussed. And it's important to remember that even though, again, the Mishnah is only codified in 200 of the Common Era, it's a codification of these oral discussions and teachings and arguments between di different rabbis uh, were taking place well beforehand, but eventually as uh, this is um, after really a Bar Kokhba revolt, and it's clear uh, uh, Jews are going to be living in a galut in a, in a scattered way for quite a long time. Eventually they decide they really have to write it down because these oral traditions probably aren't gonna survive in a strictly oral, uh, a strict, in a strictly oral manner. Okay, so let's go to the next place. Okay, so this, this really gets to Jonathan's question. Why were scholars wrong regarding the disputes? So scholars thought the reason for the disputes were, as I put it, the big ticket issues, angels, do they exist or not, life after death, uh, these type of things. Uh, what's the, is the oral law, of, is this oral law valid? Like the Sadducees uh, said, no, they, they were literalists. So they thought this is what these three groups were really arguing about until this letter showed up. And it doesn't seem like they're really, it doesn't mean they don't disagree on the big, big ticket issues. They're not, they're just not particularly worked up over the big ticket issues. It's like uh, comparing Democrats and Republicans, let's say. And there, there may be uh, issues which they disagree about, but it doesn't really get all that much press. And then there are issues which get a tremendous amount of press in disagreement. So what's getting the uh, the press in the disagreement, what we would call minor issues with, with uh, which way does uh, purity travel up, up, just downwards or upwards and downwards. OK. So we, what we have to remember here uh, until until the uh, until the 1890s, the scrolls were, were in the hands of Christian scholars who weren't experts in Jewish law. So the 1890s, by the way, is a reference to when, uh, when they didn't even realize it was a dead ski scroll, but this is a reference to the one found in the Cairo Geniza, the Damascus document, by the way. So, and then in 47, remember originally, these were Christian scholars who were looking at this. So part of it is just a, another type of cultural disconnect in the sense that they don't real uh, Jew, Jews who are active in Judaism, even modestly active, have an idea of just how legalistic Jew, Jewish law could be and Jewish culture can be. Uh, how uh, the Talmud is known for uh, these hair splitting, these hair splitting type of arguments. If anything, in a certain sense, if you remember back from the last history course, if you did it with me. You talk about uh, you talk about I think it was Pablo Cristiano who was a converted Jew in one of these uh, debates. Was he debate? Was this the one where he debated? Was it, I think this was the one where he debated Nachman and he's the Ranban. Even though I may be, there was a couple famous ones we covered, so I may be conflating the two. But basically, basically looks at the Talmud and he says you have you have to be able to take the pearls out from all the other garbage that's in the Talmud which is really a reference to a lot of these hair splitting legalistic debates that people tend to roll their eyes at. So it's not, it's not, it's not surprising that people who aren't really familiar with Jewish culture kind of wouldn't really think very, you can't blame them. They're not just not thinking about this. Of course, what are they going to argue about? They're going to argue about life after death and is, is the uh, oral law uh, for real or is it just some cockamamie thing people made up to give themselves authority? So they they missed it. And yeah. also and and also what happened is uh, Josephus, when talking about the sex, the, the major Jewish sex, really doesn't men doesn't mention these arguments over points of law either. He also talks about life after death and oral law and and these type of uh, angels and these type of things. Why? Why doesn't he mention them? Because he's writing for a Greco-Roman audience, and people aren't going to be people aren't going to be interested in does impurity go upwards as well 
as downwards. And if you think about uh, you think about Roman, how the Christian world develops, uh, the big the big arguments are really a, a bigger picture issues. Think about the Council of Nicaea, where the first of these ecumenical councils, we are really debating the nature of Jesus. Jesus is he, is he the same su substance as the Father, or uh, a slightly different substance? Uh, big ticket issues. So um, they so you could you could see how you could see how this was missed until this letter popped up. Okay, uh, the letter, however, does confirm what Josephus says about how the Essenes are the strictest of the groups, and it also is interesting. Uh, you could throw this in at your next cocktail party, I guess. Uh, it shows that the word halacha was being used earlier on during this period. Up until now, the term halacha is refer as a term referring to Jewish law. It was what maybe it showed up a little later on in uh, in Jewish history, but it, be, it, it but it appears now when the Essenes were around as a group, the term halacha as a way of saying Jewish law was actually in use. Okay, so the legacy of these different groups, as I like to say, the Pharisees won, we've already mentioned this because they're the last man standing. That's an overstatement, which we'll talk about, but nevertheless, they, they're the last group, which is really publicly standing as any sort, any sort of force. We've, I think we've talked about, if not in this class, you probably heard me tell the story of how when uh, Yonatan ben Zakkai realizes the Romans are about to destroy the temple and destroy Jerusalem and, and it game over as uh, you, the rabbis were telling the, the zealots, this is a stupid idea to fight against the Romans. You're not going to win when he realizes, okay, they are going to destroy Jerusalem. He's able to convince the Romans to let him build a yeshiva in Yavna an academy in Yavna to study Torah. And this is, and this is how the, the Pharisees via Yonatan ben Zakkai and then Rabbi Gabriel, who's the next major figure, wind up preserving Judaism. So it's preserved out of this Pharisaic tradition, which becomes uh, the Talmudic tradition, rabbinic Judaism, as we would call it. Okay, however, there's a, a strain of Sadducean uh, thought, which at least isn't totally crushed and stays alive and then reemerges in the eighth century with the Karaites who pick up on the Sadducean idea that all we need is the written text. They, they deny the Torah Shabbat path the oral law. So this creates all sorts of uh, problems of, in, the eighth, in the eighth century as they become for a while a, a major challenge to the rabbinic authority. They lost, there's a lot of politics, which is not particularly surprising. They had other uh, anti-rabbinic factions as well who ne didn't necessarily agree with them, joined them. They joined the Karaites simply because uh, the friend, the enemy of my uh, enemy is my friend type of thing. But eventually the Karaites more or less peter out. Then you still hear them, maybe one or two Karaite synagogues in the United States. Uh, and then we have a Damascus document detailing the sect's foundings. Uh, we're still being read in Cairo, uh, the 10th to, uh, 10th to 12th century of the Common Era. The fact that it was they were five, it was still being copied and found in Skeniza showed that obviously it hadn't been completely forgotten. Okay, so the next lecture we'll be talking about is the Qumran biblical canon, canon, which will really give us a good overall view of what the sect believes. Let's exit out with Q&A. Rabbi? Right, we have a nice group, nice group of people here. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, I just got a question. It goes back to what um, Harry had asked originally. I mean, if these guys, if Strugnell and all of the, you know, the... the Eco Biblic that had control of the scrolls in 47, and he holds this thing for 30 years. When you think, if you can't understand the minutia, wouldn't you bring in at least one Jewish scholar? I mean, these guys must have been ardent anti Semites to sit there for 30 years and think, I don't want to let anybody see this. This is all complicated Jewish legal argument. Why wouldn't you bring in a Jewish scholar to let him let him elaborate, let him teach them? It, it just shows you it, it just wasn't handled properly. No, I mean, that's been a continuous thread since we, they were first discovered 
in 47 is all these bizarre mishandlings of the situation and you, you think a treasure like this he'd, he'd want to get out there and uh, have other people look at it who have the expertise as well and it's it's unfortunate and uh, anti-semitic motivations uh, i mean sir Certainly would make sense. I obviously I can't get into his head, but you'd have to suspect uh, something was strange about what happened. That's for sure. Very strange. Okay. Rabbi. Yes, Alan. Um, I, I certainly understand Scott's point of, about uh, uh, anti-Semitic uh, views here. And, and that may have played a role, but, but that may be so visceral a component of, of people that uh, grew up between, between the two world wars and are now the scholars post-World War II that uh, they simply may have been clueless that there might be somebody around who could understand it. Well, I mean, it's, that's a good point. By the time we get into the 70s and 80s, I mean, you, ha you have uh, already, uh, you have a state, now we have, even as a 48, you have a state of Israel and you have, and you have Jewish scholars clearly in the vicinity. And I mean, we, we don't really know why, and we could only speculate. It's just, it, it clearly is bizarre that he just sat on it for so long. I mean, uh, I think know, Harriet has. Uh, let, me, let me let me just uh, just uh, just let 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 Alan finish, then, and then we'll go to Harriet. Yeah, this is a small point here. Uh, how how many Jewish scholars consult Christian scholars when there are issues about uh, um, the you know like the apocrypha and other, other aspects like this as to what the what the meanings of these are or even what the role of Jesus is on Judaism. I don't know. Well, but, but, that's, that's, that's a common thing for, for Jews to consult uh, schol scholarly Christians of different uh, branches. Well, I'd imagine when you're in an academic setting, people are consulting each other because it's not necessarily a religious pursuit. It's an academic pursuit. Right. Uh, so I'd imagine that. But I mean, on the other hand, when a guy in the yeshiva is sitting there studying uh, a piece of Talmud and it mentions something that has to do with uh, Christianity in, in some way, or he's studying a later text that has to do with Christianity, is he going to run so quickly to uh, a church or whatever and consult, uh, consult a, a pastor or, or a priest or something? Probably not. So... Um, it depends what venue you're talking about. Yeah, In an academic yeah. setting, the answer is yes. People are consulting each other. Well, I, I, uh, I mean, I mean, part of the issue may have been the, the original guys who uh, started doing the excavations and the scholarship were were they were scholars, but they had a Christian religious uh, background as well. And there seemed there was probably a certain amount of politics and who, who is going to be in control of the program and all of that type of stuff. So there's all these strange factors going on here. Sometimes they Harriet, see what they want to see. Don't, don't Absolutely. You think, don't you think maybe their egos got in the way? I mean, they had this treasure and they did not want to share it with anyone. They had it. They were going to keep it. They were going to be sure nobody else got their hands on it because it was really important and it was theirs. And I think probably there, I mean, not that I'm saying all academics have an ego, but they do. They, their egos got in the way of them sharing this and saying, guess what we found? Take a look. See if you can figure out more than we can figure out. Doesn't sound like a bunch of people that found these things. Yeah, I mean, look, listen, you're dealing with people and egos, egos do come into it. And this was a big deal. This was a serious find after it really came to light after it was, uh, I mean, originally it was uh, sold for a hundred dollars or whatever it was. You remember we discussed that and no one really realized that and the initial upon an initial find no one realized what a big deal this was but by the time it becomes known this is a big deal this is a serious historical find 
uh, of course, people want to be able to uh, take charge and take the credit, just like in, in, in any professional uh, walk of life, you, you, ha you have these. It reminds me of a funny story once uh, where we got to, uh, the rabbis were all invited to put up a, a mezuzah at the governor's match mansion was uh, Jack Markell was governor. And, and the person uh, from the Federation who was arranging this said, well, the um, you guys don't have to fight, like in a joking way. So you don't have to fight over who's going to actually place the mezuzah. It'll be whoever's a, uh, the president of Derech will uh, will get to do it. So fortunately, I was the president. I got to, I got to do it. But um, yeah, of course, every you know, it's, it's like put up the mezuzah. The government's governor's mansion. Of course, we wouldn't want to do it. So all these type of issues come into play when you're dealing with real people. Okay, anyone else? No? Okay, you're letting me off relatively more thing easily for tonight. One yes, more thing Mark. Um, you said this was a letter. Was it ever, do we know that this letter was actually delivered or sent, or maybe it was crumpled up and thrown aside because they decided it wasn't worth it? So that that is that is not addressed, even though you, you one would have to suspect that uh, this was one of many letters because they had the scriptorium. It seems to be a major part of what they did was copying letters. So there's probably a whole bunch of them. And uh, I would I would suspect it certainly was sent being that these people really had an agenda. They were upset. And uh, I don't see any reason why it was it wasn't set. Now, what what was the reaction? The uh, if it if it was sent, did the Sadducee and priests in Jerusalem really care, or did they say this, these are a bunch of wacky uh, wackos in the desert, kind of like hermit people living in their own little colony out there? We can really care less. But uh, it's a good question. It's a good question. My my guess my guess is this was one one of many copies, and it was sent. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, so why don't we uh, why don't we call it an evening and uh, please join me next week? It should be a good one as we look at really get an overview of the Qumran biblical canyon, which should be quite fascinating. Okay. Brooke Tahir, everyone. Okay, look, my pleasure.